Seated. I ask you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel. And if you don't know where Ezekiel is, um, you can start by turning to the middle of your Bible. I'll do it with you. Turn to the middle of your Bible. And if you're in Psalms, um, turn right from there. And uh, if you get to Daniel, um, you've gone too far. Okay? If you get to Matthew, you've gone way too far. All right? But I want you to turn to the end of the book of Ezekiel, if you would, chapter 48. So we continue our series in the names of God and in the character of God and getting to know Him. Our goal is um, to continue with this theme of being united with Christ, to know our life is found in Him and in Him alone, that we have no life outside of Christ. We have no, we have no reason to live outside of Christ, but beyond that, we actually have no life outside of Christ. Everything that we do is within Christ as His children. When we've been bought with a price, when we've been made children of God, then our entire life is hidden with Christ. So you have no life as a child of God outside of Jesus Christ. And we like to think of our lives in categories like this is secular and this is religious, this is Christian, and this is my work. But we're not allowed to think that way anymore as believers in Christ. We don't get to think that way. There are no Christian versus non-Christian things anymore for the one who is in Christ Jesus. We are in Christ, which means all of your life is wrapped up in who he is. So if you know something is completely secular and gives no honor and glory to God, it's no longer called secular or non-religious. It's called sin. Because our lives are here, we're here, we're made in Christ to give honor and glory to Him. So I just want to make sure we understand the goal here is not just to learn a bunch of facts. The goal here is not just to come and listen to a sermon. In fact, you're going to learn today the danger of coming and listening to sermons. And it's not sleep. That's not the danger, okay? You're going to learn some of the danger of what it is to come to church and to listen to sermons, so I was studying for this, um, for this sermon. I was struggling through how best to talk about the fact that the Lord is the Lord God is there or Jehovah Shammah. What does it mean for the Lord to be with us? And I could go all kinds of places in Scripture. This theme of the God being with His people is throughout Scripture. I could give you tons of them. I'll give you a few right now that, that I found as I was just... These are just the tip of the iceberg. Right? You can just find these throughout Scripture. Exodus 33, verse 14, And He said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Joshua 1, 9. This is one that we know quite well. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. And do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Psalm 145, 18. The Lord is near to all who call on Him, to all who call on Him in truth. Psalm 73, 28. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. We're told, I will never leave you or forsake you. We can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Matthew 28, 19 through 20. We call this the Great Commission. We're told, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We're told that the Spirit of God, when we become children of God, dwells inside of us. So God is always with us. When Jesus left to go back to the Father, he said he's sending a helper who will always be with us. We're told that one day we will be with him. It's, this idea of us being with God and God being with us is throughout all of Scripture. And so as I went through it, I was like, man, I could just preach one of these really great, pat everybody on the back, and as you go out this week, and you'll, you'll go out this week, and I'll say, God is with you, praise the Lord. And you'll all be remembering on Tuesday afternoon that God is with you, and you'll all feel good about that. And, and then I was like, but I'm Brad, I don't do that. So um, it's not kind of, <laughs> kind of not what I do. So, um, but on top of that, I don't think that that's what God wants us to know. I don't think God wants us to come to church for rah-rah sessions. We get enough of that, don't we? We get enough of people telling us, patting us on the back. I mean, everybody's got bumper stickers telling how great their middle school students are. So we know how great we are. We're told all the time how great we are. The, the world is telling us, don't let anybody take anything away from you because you're awesome. 
We've now got Baptist preachers in churches telling, telling everybody how awesome they are, that God loves you because you're awesome. I want you to know God loves you because he's awesome. I want you to know that God is full of grace and mercy, not because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are fearfully and wonderfully made because he's full of grace and mercy. That's what I want you to know. I want you to know this whole story starts and ends with him. Not with you and with me. And so sometimes that means we come to a point where things are a little difficult. So as I was studying for this, I realized there's only one place in all of Scripture where God actually says, Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is there. And that's at the end of the book of Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is a weird book. How many of you have read Ezekiel? It's a weird book, right? It's weird. So weird that back in the day, you know, the Jewish tradition was you wouldn't let boys read this until they got older because it was just too strange. It would disturb them. There'd be nightmares, and they wouldn't understand the character of God. They'd get mixed up. And it's, it's, it's a strange book. God calls on Ezekiel to do some weird stuff in this book. And God is telling his people something through Ezekiel that he wants us to know as well. And has everything to do with the presence of God. It has everything to do with the presence of God. So I wanna, I, what I decided to do is I was really looking through all of this and praying through it, is I decided to just go to the end of Ezekiel, to Jehovah Shammah, and to give you an up, kind of a, just an overview of the whole book of Ezekiel today. Because I think as we go through the book of Ezekiel, I'm not going to read the whole book to you. I encourage you to go home and read this this week yourself. Be weirded out, just like I was. Okay? But I want to give you tools to be able to see this. It would be really good for you to take notes on some of this because my plan is to be here for the next 35, 40 years. And so at some point we're going to preach through Ezekiel. So you'll already have notes. That'll give you one Sunday at least where you won't have to pay attention. Um, but more than anything, I think this will help us as we really think on and meditate on the presence of God. The fact that God desires to be among his people. God had made for himself a people. And he made for himself a people in this way. He took Abraham and he took his family and his line and he made himself a nation from the lineage of Abraham. And he told them, I didn't choose you out of all the nations because you were great. I choose you because you're nothing. I didn't say, hey, you guys are awesome. I'm going to make you my nation. If he wanted to do that, he'd probably gone with the Egyptians. But he made a nation for himself. He made a nation for himself, and then he worked everything out in accordance with his will that they would be in slavery in Egypt. Then he set them free. He set them free by works of his power. And then as they're wandering through the wilderness, we call it wandering through the wilderness, as they're being led by the Spirit of God through the wilderness, by the very presence of God through the wilderness, he makes his presence known to them with a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud, a pillar of smoke. And so here they are during the day and the night. They know that the Lord is leading them and there's no question as to where they should go. So they weren't wandering. He was just leading them. And in the middle of the desert, in the middle of the wilderness, God is demonstrating his presence among them. At, at, when they would camp, the tabernacle would be set up and the presence of God would come and rest among the people. And they would know his presence. And he said things like this, you will be my people and I will be your God. That's awesome, right? That's fantastic stuff. And then they're getting to the promised land, this land that he's promised for them to go to. And he, he says, I've got a land for you, and you're going to be my people. I'm going to be your God. I'm going to be your king. I'm going to be with you. It's going to be great. You're going to run out all the other people. You're not going to fall victim to their idols. You're not going to sell yourself to those idols. We talked a little bit about that last week. You know, I make a covenant with you that I will show you mercy and grace and forgive your sins. And your job is to not sell yourself to everybody else's idols. Don't sell yourself to this world. But have me as your God and me as your king. So he warned them from the beginning about their idolatry. In fact, he would go so far as to say, when you take up for yourself idols, when you start, break this covenant, then there's going to be discipline that comes with that. And he warns them over and over and over again about selling themselves to other gods, about taking on the form of worship without actually worshiping the Lord their God with their hearts and their minds and their souls and their strength. How they could go through the motions of worship without actually worshiping Him. 
worshiping God at all. The prophet Isaiah warned King Hezekiah. Jeremiah urged Jerusalem to turn back to the Lord, even to surrender to the Babylonians. They were coming to set, lay siege to Jerusalem. He's like, just go ahead and surrender. This is God's discipline on you because we have turned from God. And Ezekiel, at a, around the same time as Jeremiah, begins to, begins to prophesy as well. And it happened after Jerusalem had been laid siege and people had been taken out of Jerusalem into exile. They were taken to Babylon. They were taken to this place, this alien place, this, this place where it seemed like God wasn't with them anymore. They didn't have a temple anymore to worship in. They didn't know what to do. Ezekiel seems like he has no job anymore to do because there's no temple to worship in. And he goes and he begins to prophesy in the name of the Lord. And he starts doing this weird junk all the time. Because God has a message for his people in exile. I want you to know today God has a message for his people in exile. Because that's who we are. We're his people in exile. We're waiting for the land, right? We're waiting for his return. We're waiting to, for the promised land that, of his presence forever and ever. We're waiting to experience all that he's promised us fully. So we, we're, we're a people in exile. In fact, in Revelation, we're going to learn that Babylon has fallen when Jesus returns. That's the cry of joy that we'll hear, that Babylon the Great has fallen. Because we live in exile now, and Ezekiel was prophesying in this exile. Ten years after Ezekiel left Jerusalem as uh, the royal family and others were taken into exile, ten years later, the actual temple would be destroyed and the, the city itself would be destroyed. Then he'll prophesy through this whole time. Ezekiel himself was a bit of an odd man. He was asked to do some really odd things by God. God called Ezekiel to all kinds of odd behavior as he gave him visions and dreams. He communicated those things in weird and fantastic ways. He lived as a, re as a recluse for a while. He basically locked himself in his house for a while. He even tied himself up in his house so he couldn't get out. Um, when he, God commanded him, when his own wife died, God took his wife from him and he said, don't mourn your wife. God always had a message through all of that. God wasn't being arbitrary. There's even a time where Ezekiel had his tongue glued to the top of his mouth so he couldn't speak anymore. Now imagine what church would be like. Right? Pastor Roger with his bum eye, me with my tongue you know, glued to the top of my mouth. Right? And it, what was God telling people? God had all kinds of things to tell his people, but they all centered around this one notion. God is king and is God present with his people. The presence of God became the key to understanding everything that Ezekiel was talking about and prophesying about. So Ezekiel is a little difficult to understand, but it's not hard to get the flow of what's going on. I want to tell you about three parts. You can write this down, really helpful. Three sections. Ezekiel is written in three sections. Part one demonstrates quite simply that God is king, that he is perfect, that he is holy, that he is separate from us, that he is not like us, that he disciplines people. His discipline is coming. His people must submit to him because he's the king, but they are not going to submit to him, so his discipline is going to come. Isn't that love? Isn't that what love, real love is? Is that those who love us, that are in charge of us, will discipline us when we won't obey? It's not loving to have kids that you, let, that you never discipline. But God disciplines those whom he loves. And God as the king will discipline his people. He is completely holy, completely different from us. And so throughout section one, the character of God is holy and perfect. And the king who is almighty is laid out. In part two question is God's presence. Is God with his people? In, verse, in chapters 10 and 11, Ezekiel is shown a vision. He's taken, up on the, he's taken into the holy place and he's taken up on a hill outside of town and he's shown a vision of God's glory being in the holy of holies and then moving outside the holy of holies to the threshold or the doorway. Then moving outside the temple and moving outside the courtyard then moving outside the city and then moving away. God's glory leaving his people. God's presence leaving his people. That there would be destruction that would come because his people had turned to idols. Because his people had turned to a form of worship instead of actually worshiping the living God. 
And so his presence was no longer going to be among his people. Part two is all about God's presence leaving the temple in Jerusalem because the people were so intent on protecting their way of life that they forgot that they were there to honor God. They were so intent on protecting Jerusalem and protecting the temple that they forgot their job was simple. Honor God. To be subjects to the king. To follow him, to obey him. The people of God began to treasure the land and the city more than they treasured God. The people of God began to treasure the outward trappings of worship more than they, more than they actually treasured the God they were to worship. It should be a sober reality check for us, shouldn't it? It should be a sober reality check for us. Because I look at my life and... I have to ask the question, what do I treasure? Do I treasure God himself or do I treasure the things that God gives me? I love our church. I, lo I love you. But do I treasure you more than I treasure God himself? Do I treasure the programs and the ideas of what we have going on more than I treasure God himself? Do I treasure an idea more than I treasure the ultimate reality? Do I treasure what I like more than the one who loves me? And gave himself up for me. It's a question I have to ask myself. Do I love my family more than I love God? Do I love comfort more than I love God? Do I love money more than I love God? Do I love stuff more than I love God? Do I love holding on to the gifts that God has given me more than I love the fact that God holds on to me? That's the question that's at hand for us today. Is, is the glory of God departed from his people the sovereign Yahweh, the sovereign Lord, was going to work out a plan to bring his people back to him. And I praise the Lord for that, that even in my stubbornness and my sinfulness, and I encourage you to know this, even in your stubbornness and your sinfulness, God is still for you and not against you. God is still for you and not against you. But our desire should be for the God who is for us to be with us. Not just for us, but with us. What kind of powerful work would God do among us and through us in our community and the world if our greater concern was that God be with us? The glory of God was leaving his people. The presence of God was leaving his people. This, this was something that God threatened to do at another time. Before they entered the promised land, uh, Moses was with God and God said, I'm not going with you. I'm not going with you because of your idolatry and because of your sin, because you won't obey me, because you hear my word and you won't obey it. I'm not going with you. And Moses' reaction was, if you're not going, we're not going. If you're not going, we don't want to go. We're, if you're not going with us, we're not going anywhere. That should be on every banner that's ever printed up in any church. If, we're not, if you're not going with us, we're not going. And the question for us today is, are we more concerned with whether God is with us than who's right and who's wrong, who's this, who's that? Oh, that we would be zealous and jealous for the presence of God. What did it look like for God's glorious presence to leave his people? What did it look like for God's people to be blinded to their need for God's presence, there's a good indicator, and I want you to turn to Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel 33, verses 30 through 32. This is what it says. This is what it looked like in Jerusalem. This is what it looked like um, in, in exile, even, among the people of God. Ezekiel 33. As for you, son of man, your people who talk together about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses, say to one another, each to his brother, come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. Basically, they're all standing around outside going, you should all come to church. Basically, what they're doing, they're inviting each other to church. Okay, So they're all gathering together like, you should come to church. You come hear from the Lord. Come hear the word that comes from the Lord. And they come to you as people come, and they sit before you as my people, and they hear what you say, but they will not do it. Yikes. 
For with lustful talk in their mouths they act. Their heart is set on their gain. And behold, you are to them like one who sings lustful songs with a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument. For they hear what you say, but they will not do it. The mark of God's presence leaving his people is people hearing God's word, but not obeying it. I'm going to tell you, my least favorite thing, my pet peeve of all pet peeves um, as a pastor, I got several pet peeves, so I, like, I don't have any real pets, but I have pet peeves, okay? And uh, pet peeves are everything from, um, like, I don't, I don't know if child molesters can be pet peeves. I just think that they all need to, like, put a, be put on an island somewhere, but that's one. Okay, if I hear anything like that, it just gets everything riled up in me. But as a pastor, my pet peeve is this. When people come and they say things like, well, I know the Bible says it, but... Well, then what's the point? Now, m- most of us are smart enough to never actually say those words. We just live that way. I know the Bible says it, but... Pray for those who persecute you. I know the Bible says it, but... Go, tell others. I know the Bible says it, but... You may never say those words, but the question for us is, are we living that way? Are we living as if we're coming and hearing the word, but we're not obeying it? Mark Dever, a pastor up in D.C., puts it this way, the people would simultaneously sit here and enjoy God's word and then ignore it. They would go through all the nation, all the motions of worshiping God, but their hearts were devoted to idols. This is the same type of thing that Jesus dealt with. This is not something that ended. This is something that continued. Remember who Jesus dealt with in his ministry? He dealt with the Pharisees. And what was said about the Pharisees? They glorify me or they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They go through all the outward trappings. They go through all the motions, but their hearts are far from me. Deborah continues, in short, the people of Israel were tempted to trust the wealth of their land, the political stability of, the, of David's line, and even the temple itself, all the while ignoring God's word. So none of these, these things would save God's people. None of these things will work as objects of our trust today either. Not wealth, not political stability, not religiousness, not even sitting and enjoying the preaching of God's word. We do not just need religion. We need a real and exclusive devotion to the one True God. And man, there's a world of difference. It's a danger that comes with coming and hearing the preaching of the word. (laughs) Sometimes we think that that's all we have to do is hear it. But we're told by James what? Be doers of the word, not hearers only. My desire for us is really simple. That the presence of the Lord would be so real among us that we would be the most obedient that we would be the first to go that we would be the ones who would live with one devotion and that devotion would be to Christ that's my goal it's my goal as your pastor my goal is to, isn't to constantly beat us up my goal is to give you freedom the freedom to have the only devotion that would actually last and matter We can be devoted to a lot of things, but ultimately none of them will matter. Only Christ will remain. And so we can find our hope and we can find our trust. We can put our trust in all kinds of things. Family, that's good. I like family. I like my family. My family's pretty cool. But I can put my trust in my family and it can be an idol. Put my trust in a church or a building or a place. But paradise is not wrapped up in a place. Paradise paradise is wrapped up in the presence of God among his people. Do you desire the presence of God more than you desire a place or a person or anything else? Are we going to settle for less is the question. The absence of the presence of God is marked by people hearing God's word but ignoring its call to obedience. But the good news is that's not the end of the story. There's a third part to Ezekiel. And that's the good news. The good news is found in Ezekiel 43, verses 1 through 5. And this should drive us to glorify God tremendously. 
Ezekiel 43 verses 1 through 5 says this. Then he led me to the gate. This is another vision of Ezekiel. The gate facing east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the east. This is the same glory that left is now returning. And the sound of his coming was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. And the vision I saw was just like the vision that I had seen when he came to destroy the city, and just like the vision that I had seen by the Chabar Canal. And I fell on my face... As the glory of the Lord entered the temple by the gate facing east, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. God will not desert his people. He will return to his people. But when is this going to happen? How is this going to happen? What is this going to look like? What is it going to look like for God to come back among his people? Well, we know that after... The exile, Ezra and Nehemiah bring the people back and begin to rebuild the walls and begin to rebuild the, the temple. And when the temple is rebuilt, this second temple, we see no clue in Ezra's writings that the Spirit of God and the glory of God refilled that temple. In fact, we actually see pictures of the older saints crying because of the lack of the glory of God in this new temple. They're disturbed by how small and how pitiful it is compared to the original temple. They're disturbed by that, and they're crying over it. And the fact of the matter is, there's no glory of God coming and resting on the temple. There's no glory of God filling up the temple. Nowhere do we read of that in Ezra's writings. And we know that the same problem that led up to the exile is the same problem that continues. The people are still prone to idolatry. They're still falling Pray to the idea of just going through religion instead of desiring the presence of the Lord. But I want to show you when things change in the temple. I want to show you two places. One is something that's already happening, happened, and one is something that we're longing to happen, and we're waiting for it to happen. The first is in Luke chapter 2. One day, the glory of God would fill the temple again. Luke chapter 2. Verses 29 through 32. You may remember the story of Simeon. He was a man who served the temple. He was a man who was in the temple. He was a man who hung around the temple. He was a man who God had said, I won't let you die until you see the Messiah, until you see the promised one. I'm not going to let you die. So you can imagine him going to the temple every day going, is that them? Is that them? Is that the family? Is that the family? Is that the family? You can almost imagine that. He's getting up in years and he's waiting to be with the Lord, but he's been promised that he's going to see the Messiah. And in Luke chapter 2, verses 29 through 32, this is what happens when he takes the baby Jesus into his arms. When he takes this child into his arms, this is what he says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. When Mary and Joseph walked the baby Jesus into the temple, the glory of God was with man again. Filling the temple. Praise the Lord. Because in that glorious presence of God, we see grace and truth and love, and mercy, because we see the pursuing grace, and mercy, and love of our God, who comes after us, that while we were still sinners, he died for us, that he so loved us, that he sent his son, we see all of that, in this baby, entering the temple, this second temple, this temple that was lacking glory, now is filled with the glorious presence, of God Almighty, in the flesh, and our hope is based on, on everything he did and everything he said and everything he accomplished. And if your hope is based on anything else, it's sinking sand. Because we're told that one day the presence of God, the glory of God, the kingdom of God will be with man. And that's the second time his glory is going to fill the temple and it's going to fill it completely. And at the end of Ezekiel, you see all this measurement that's happening and all of the tribes being listed out. You see this imagery of this new temple and this new city that's being built. And in Revelation chapter 21, John is led up to see what it looks like for God to become 
to come and be with man. What it looks like that in the end, all of God's people will be with God. And what does it look like? It looks like a city. It looks like a city, just like Ezekiel chapter 48. It looks like a city coming down from heaven that the glory of God would be with man. And in Revelation chapter 21, this is what it says. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Please underline that in your Bible because that's our hope. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. I'm really fascinated by this. One, I long for it. Two, I I love the order of things and the primacy of things that are said here and the way they're laid out because He doesn't say, behold, there will be no more pain and there will be no more sorrow and there will be no more tears. He doesn't rest any of the hope of heaven on the things we get in heaven. He gives us one hope and he bases everything else on this one hope. And what is it? The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Is your hope based on a place or on the very presence of God? Because he doesn't say, hey, you know, heaven is going to be awesome. And when the new heavens and the new earth become one, when God comes to be with his people, he doesn't say, this is your great hope. Uncle Joe is going to be there. It's not what he says. He doesn't say you're going to be reunited with grandpa. Praise the Lord. I look forward to that. But his hope is God is with his people. And he will be their God and they will be his people. The glory of God will fill up the place where his people dwell. That's what it means when it says in Ezekiel 48, and the name of the city from that time on on shall be, the Lord is there. Jehovah Shema. So what does it look like for us to desire the presence of God? What is paradise? What is our hope? Is our hope a nation, a place, a feeling, a comfort, stuff? Is it any of those things? Or is our real paradise the presence of God? We can easily fall into the same idolatry as the people of Israel did. Easily. And I would say that given the size of the crowd today, some, if not many of us, struggle with that. Maybe all of us struggle with the fact that we prop up other things to find our paradise more than the presence of God. Paradise is not going to be found in America, a certain church, a comfortable wealth, a family, a home, a job, a particular way of life. The hope of heaven is not just that we have a perfect place to go to, it's that God is there. So if you want to find that hope in that paradise today, it's going to be in the presence of God. It's not going to be any other way. But man, how do you know if you're falling prey to this? I'm going to give you one way you can know. It's what you worry about, what you think about, what you concern yourself with, what you wake up thinking about, what you go to bed thinking about. What you pray about. What do you spend your time praying about? Do you pray for other people to know Jesus? Do you pray for things to work out in your life? It's a huge indicator of where our hearts are. Do you pray for other people to experience the presence of God in their lives so that they would come to know him as Lord and as King? Do we worry more about stock markets and comfort than we do about billions who have never heard? Well, I think there's two ways we can be a part and be sure as children of God, by grace through faith, that God is with us as we go. 
One is this. Go ye therefore. We read it. Matthew 28, right? Go therefore and make disciples, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he closes that out by saying, and I am with you always. The I am with you always is connected to the commission, to the commandment to go. You can't take the two and separate them. You can't just say, I am with you always. Praise the Lord. You have to take the first part too. His promise to be with us is as we go. That doesn't mean you need to get on a plane to Africa tomorrow. It may just mean you have to walk across the street. It may just mean you need to talk to somebody about Jesus more than you talk about the weather or sports or girls or boys or the economy or anything else. It may just be that as you go, you would be a part of demonstrating the presence of God with you. The second is this, don't love money and comfort. You want to make sure the presence of God is with you, don't love money and comfort. And this comes from Hebrews 13. It says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Praise the Lord for that, right? But right before that it says, keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. You want to know the presence of God? It's time to clear out everything else. Everything else that crowds his presence out. Don't love money. Live your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. When we're content with what we have, we know that he's the one who provided. That's what we're saying by contentment. We're not saying don't go out and do well. We're not saying don't go out and get a good job. We're not saying don't go out and be rich. We're not saying that at all. Just be content with whatever the Lord gives you. Because when you are content, you're saying, I trust God more than I trust myself. I trust God more than I trust money. I trust God more than I trust my boss. I trust God more than I trust my job. I trust God more than I trust the gift of the abilities that he's given me. I trust God. So the question for us today is this. We want to know the presence of God, Jehovah Shammah. The question for us is, are we willing to trust him? Are we willing to trust him? Or are we going to trust ourselves? Are we going to be the ones who come and hear what his word tells us and then not do it because we trust our ways more than his ways? Do we want to see Powhatan reached for the gospel? Anybody, raise your hand if you want to see Powhatan reached for the gospel. Do you assume that's going to happen by us coming here every Sunday? What needs to change then? What needs to change in me? What needs to change in you? What needs to change in the way we do things? It's not going to happen through programs of the church. It's going to happen. I am one person. Roger is two. We're we're two. You take our families. We still don't outnumber you. As you go, as you go, he is with you. He's not just with me. He's not just with Roger. He's with you. As you go, you will speak the gospel with the same authority that Roger and I ever could. Maybe with more because he's with you. So as you go, what, do we want to see our world reach for the gospel? We want to see our world come to know Christ and know his presence. Do we want to see people from every tribe and tongue and nation and people come around the throne? God's going to accomplish it with us or without us. But do we want to be a part of knowing the presence of God as we go? It starts with one step, folks. That's all it takes. It starts with one step of obedience. To hear his word and obey. One of my favorite hymns is Trust and Obey. So simple, isn't it? Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. It's not just obey, not just do all the things he tells you to do. It's trust. It's faith that leads to obedience. It's what your life needs to look like. That's what my life needs to look like. And in doing so, we will ensure that we will know Jehovah Shema. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we would be people of faith that would be led to obedience. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.